All right, yeah, that's the text, Isaiah 66, starting in verse 1. We look at the whole chapter today. We say goodbye to the book of Isaiah. Uh, The topic, human remains from the battles of the great tribulation will be visible during the millennial kingdom. The title of the message, the remains of the day of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for showing us a lot about the future mostly that Jesus is coming. He's coming, of course, a second time, Lord, to save Israel and establish the kingdom. But he's coming, you're coming, Lord, to take us home, too, before that. And that's a great hope. It is our blessed hope, the Bible says. And I pray that we would just find ourselves exercising that hope as we see the hopeless, helpless conditions around us problems that seemingly have no answer, no solving. Without being smug, Lord, we know that you are the answer. You have solves and solutions. And just like in many of our lives, Lord, when we uh, you know, hit the wall and, and turned and, and then received you, you, you changed everything. Miraculously, wonderfully, and situations that were helpless and hopeless, Lord, became filled with hope. If there's anybody here this morning, Lord, that needs that kind of infusion of hope, I pray that they would get it in the word. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, amen. At the end of Life of Pi, 16-year-old Pi Patel tells two different versions of his ocean survival story to the officials investigating the shipwreck. The first account involves him surviving 227 days at sea in a lifeboat with a zebra, an orangutan, Uh, a hyena and a Bengal tiger named Richard Parker. The hyena kills the zebra and later the orangutan. Uh, Richard Parker kills the hyena. The officials don't believe his fanciful account. Pai retells the story. The animals are replaced by humans. The cook kills the sailor and feeds on his flesh. He then kills Pai's mother, after which Pai kills him and uses his remains as food and fish bait at which point your book club disbands. (laughs) It's a good thing that the book of Isaiah doesn't have a bizarre ending. Let's look at it in verse 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. On our way to this open burial site, we're going to visit two temples, A tribulation temple, rather, in verse 1 through 9. And then a millennial kingdom temple in verses 10 through 24. It's the tale of two temples, one that God detests and one that he delights in. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, be certain that what you are building is according to God's preference. And number two, be certain that what you are building is according to God's praise. And so let's take a look at his preferences in verses 1 through 9. Now, Isaiah's ministry to Judah took place before Solomon's temple was destroyed. King Nebuchadnezzar would do the dishonor in 586 BC. Jews were taken captive and they were brought to Babylon. The Jews returned to Jerusalem after 70 years of captivity. They rebuilt their temple, the second temple, they call it, also called Zerubbabel's temple because Zerubbabel was a governor at that time over the region. Jerusalem, as you know, would come under Roman control. Herod remodeled the second temple. It's still the second temple because it was a remodel, not a rebuild. We, uh, it's called Herod's temple, but it really should just be called the second temple because Herod wasn't even a believer. It was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. It took him like 60 years to rebuild it, and just after it was rebuilt, they destroyed it. Which of these temples is Isaiah referencing? Well, neither. He looks forward and predicts another temple. It will exist in the future seven-year great tribulation, and that's why we call it the tribulation temple. So beginning in verse 1, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. Now, the Lord was never anti-temple. 
But you and I cannot build him a temple without his impetus and his instruction. We can't just assume it's a good work and that he will put his presence there. King David learned this. After he had been king for a while, the Jews were still worshiping in the tabernacle from the wilderness. And he had on his heart a desire to build the Lord a magnificent temple. Prophet Nathan told him, hey, go for it. Didn't really seek the Lord on it. So the Lord sought him on it. And he said, turn around and go tell David, he's not going to build my temple. His son will build it. I can't have him build it because he is a man of blood, a man of war. And um, for all of that entails, perhaps he didn't want people to think that it was more David's temple than his based on conquest and all. But for, any re- for whatever reason, he said, David, yeah, maybe it's a good idea. I, I don't really need a, uh, you to do it, but I'll let you do it, but it's not going to be you. And so it had to be by God's impetus and then by his instruction in the power of the Holy Spirit. The same is really true of our Christian life and walk. It must be biblical, and it must be spirit-led, and it must be in God's timing. Biblical meaning that we do things that the Bible tells us to do, and that we stay within the framework of Scripture and don't get off on other things, bringing things in from the world, like chat with Jesus and, and you know, the, the direction that the world is going in. And then it must be spirit-led, not of the flesh, not, you know, a a thing that that is devoid of the leading of the Holy Spirit. Did we pray about it? How did the Lord show us that? I've told you many times before, when I think of a church, when somebody says to me, hey, we planted a church, or this is our church, well, what's your story? I'm really big on that. What is the story? What do you mean by that? Why are you a church? How did it come about that you're a church? It's almost sometimes like asking a person, you know, are you a Christian? And you can tell they're not by their response, right? It's like, well, I grew up in church. Okay. Well, I grew up in my dad's auto shop, and I'm not a mechanic. Uh, you know, so what, what's the deal? And, and so anyway, uh, you know, it has to be spirit-led, and it has to be in God's timing. God has a perfect timing for everything. It's usually not our timing. It's usually earlier or later from our point of view. Either I'm not ready or I've been ready too long. And yet the Lord has a work to do because he's not just dealing with you. He's dealing with everyone. And if you want to make an impact for God, you will wait on his timing and then go through the doors that he opens. Verse 2 goes on and it says, But on this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Temple or no, God looks for tremblers. They know their spiritual poverty. They are contrite. That means they don't think more highly of themselves than they ought. And they are pre-submitted to God's word. Um, We talk about this from time to time. If you're a Christian, uh, you know, you get, let's say you get saved uh, and you're, you know, the Holy Spirit is living inside you. You're born again Christian. You don't know really much of anything about God or about God's word, do you? Of course not, because you've only been a Christian five minutes. But like the man that Jesus healed, you can say, well, all I know is I was blind. Now I can see that's pretty significant. And so your change is significant, but you don't really know what you believe. And so you begin to study. But you should have the attitude that whatever I discover, whatever is true, whatever the Bible actually teaches, I submit to that. I pre-submit to it because I'm a Christian learning what God has for my life. There's no discussing with God whether or not, you know, this is something I should do if he says it is. And so you, I think you get that idea. Now, I wasn't wearing my glasses this week when I was trying to read this. And at first, I read it as tremors. And I thought, man, I've got this. This is so good. <laughs> I, I, I was going to do a whole sermon on trembling, you know, my tremors and stuff. But and then I put my glasses on and it ruined everything. <laughs> we tremble when we're cold or we're weak, but we also tremble with excitement. It can be a romance word. In your embrace, I tremble, my heart a captive of your tender touch. Feel free to use that. Verse 3, he who kills a bull is as if he who slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. And so in this verse, the Jews are bringing the prescribed offerings things like a lamb to the temple, but obviously their hearts are far from God. They're, um, they're in sin. They're hypocritical. And so what the Lord is saying is, if you could see what you're doing the way I see it, 
knowing your motives and your true heart, the lamb that you're bringing, you might as well be bringing a dog and we're breaking its neck. And you think, what a horrifying image that is, you know? And, and that's what God's saying is that your, your worship looks horrible to me. I don't need that kind of worship. In fact, I abhor it. And so, you know, pulling the curtain back and seeing what's really going on in our lives is uh, very difficult sometimes, but the, the Lord will do it if we will allow him, and it is for our good. But we would say that God is not pleased with the tribulation temple, since its worshipers there are hypocrites. Uh, and so it is not something that uh, honors and glorifies God. Uh, and of course, in the middle of the tribulation, it's going to be used as a tool against uh, the Jews. Verse 3, just as they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions and bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. And when I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. There's a principle of God's discipline by which he can step back and sort of just give you what you want. If you fight against him long enough and keep refusing him and refusing him and rejecting him, like in Romans 1 where it says they kept God out of their knowledge and they pushed him aside. And he says, all right, I'm going to withdraw my presence. I'm going to withdraw my uh, safety and my security and let you have exactly what you want. And when, ha when that happens among God's people, it doesn't take long for them to deteriorate into the worst kind of sin and deprivation. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a delusion, God says here, to think a human being, much less humanity, can find their way without God's intervention. We need God. We need to depend upon the Lord and not upon our own resources. We are not independent. Um, Bob Dylan said, you've, you've got to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you've got to serve one or two, one of those two. The contemporary English version reads like this for verse 5. Some of your own people hate and reject you because of me. They make fun and say, let the Lord show his power. Let us see him make you truly happy. But those who say these things will be terribly ashamed. Um, these professing believers, um, they, they really don't seem to understand the, the joy of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, we're, we're coming along saying, hey, there's a deeper Christian life. There's a, a wonderful Christian life. And they're like, oh, yeah, show us the joy. They think you're a Jesus freak if you're 100% in for the Lord. And that would be great. The sound of noise from the city. A voice from the temple. The voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. There's a tumult at the temple, we might say. Dr. Fruchtenbaum writes, the voice that the unbelieving non-remnant will hear is the voice of Jehovah rendering recompense or judgment. Verse 7, before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Ladies, you're going to want to underline that uh, as a promise, right? No? All right, go through labor then. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Now, it's important we keep our metaphors distinct with careful reading. An event like birth, the birth of a child, can be used in different settings to teach slightly different things because birthing doesn't always happen the same way, right? He just said, hey, sometimes, uh, like in the New Testament example, the seven-year great tribulation is described like a woman having severe birth pains over a period of time. In our Isaiah passage, Israel is described as having no birth pains delivering suddenly. So it's not really connected to what we read in the New Testament. There's another scripture in Revelation 12, I think it is, talking about the, the woman about to bring forth her child and the dragon is going to devour the child. Again, very different situation. And so just because it mentions birth doesn't mean we can connect all of those. And birth in Isaiah really has two meanings. One is political and one is spiritual. He says here, shall a nation be born at once? And the answer is yes, it can and it was. Israel was born in one day. May 14 of 1948, when the British gave up control of uh, Israel and the Jews took over. 
And, and uh, you know, obviously it was working up to it throughout history enough, but it literally one day the British were in control and the next day Israel was a sovereign nation. And so that's a fulfillment of prophecy. Who is the male child? Well, normally you're programmed to say Jesus, but don't answer yet. Because this male child born without birth pains, he was born at once, and he's called children, not just one person, it's plural, thus it isn't Jesus. This is the new birth, the spiritual birth of Jews who flee Jerusalem ahead of Antichrist's attack. And so what Isaiah is saying is that like a birth that has no pain, and all of a sudden you just deliver a baby, that's how the new birth is going to come to Israel and to the Jews who survived the great tribulation. You know, every now and then there's a story of a lady who didn't know she was pregnant, right? And all of a sudden you're like, hey, so something wrong with me. Oh, what's going on? I just had a baby. And so he's describing a situation where pretty suddenly Israel brings forth this baby. And you know what? While they are holed up in Petra, hiding in Petra, uh, trying to defend themselves from the Antichrist, the prophet Hosea says they receive Jesus at once as their Messiah. They're immediately born again spiritually. It reads like this, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. And so... When all hope is lost, when they're helplessly hiding in Petra and the Antichrist forces are pressing against them, they turn to the Lord and immediately are born of the Spirit. The Lord comes and he destroys their enemies. It's an amazing thing that Isaiah is talking about. Still future to us, obviously. Verse 9, shall I bring it to the time of birth and not cause the delivery? Shall I who cause delivery shut up the womb, says the Lord? No and no. Jesus will save the elect nation of Israel. All Israel who endure to the end of the tribulation will be saved. Now, we, the church, will be in heaven while all this goes down on the tribulation earth. I, for one, am happy about that. Uh, and it's not because we're superior to any other group of people. It's just the plan that God has for us. Now, again, we always want to be careful deriving things that are promised to Israel to ourselves. But I think at least we can see that there are lessons for us involving building with or for the Lord. And so that's one area that we can glean this because they are building these various temples and one is not really ordained of the Lord and one is. And so as builders, of course, we're familiar with the passages that talk about how we want to build with precious materials and not wood, hay, and stubble. I learned an interesting lesson about building uh, back at Calvary Chapel of San Bernardino uh, when I was the assistant pastor there. We bought a building which uh, we couldn't uh, afford. We didn't know we couldn't afford it, but uh, it, it was, whoa, man, it was just, we were wildly, wildly out of money. And um, uh, there's, okay, here's the reason. Uh, so we bought this building. We thought we'd start meeting there right away, but the city said, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, you need to have it finished before you meet there. I, what do you mean finished? Like finished, finished? Yeah, you know. Meantime, the YMCA had kicked us out of meeting there and got a new tenant. So we're like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I said, well, we're going to meet there uh, because, you know, that's what the Lord told us to do. And, and so we did. This, we met there with tools in our hands so that, you know, we were, it was a work day, Sunday work days. But anyway, uh, we, wanted, we needed money. We thought we needed money, and we really didn't, you know, because God was going to take care of that, and he did. And so we went to see Don McClure. Uh, you know, Pastor Don, because he knew Chuck Smith, and people used to ask Chuck Smith to lend them money uh, for Calvary's, you know, and occasionally they would get some money. In fact, uh, he lent money to Oakhurst uh, up, up here for Calvary Chapel of the Sierra. And so we thought, well, maybe, you know, that'll happen. And so Don smiled, and then, like Don does, he told us a story that lasted about three hours, it seemed, but uh, now he, he's verbose, but I like listening to him. He's, he's a person I could listen to all day. But basically, Don, if you, once you distill it, what Don was saying to, I think there were three of us there, what he said to us was this, how much money have you put into this building? And the answer was zero. Uh, and he basically said, why should someone else want to fund what you're not willing to sacrifice for? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> So, that's a, there's, you know, there's lessons on building that are out, you know, it's like, oh, I, I never thought of that. Uh, well, 
Think of it. Be certain that what you are building is affording God praise. Isaiah mentions priests, Levites, offerings, and a religious calendar. These are all the things associated with a temple. And so now we're going to be talking about the millennial temple, and it is ordained by God. It is described in great detail by Ezekiel in chapters 40 through 48. And so um, just, I don't know if I explained this already now or first service, but basically what we're talking about here is there will be a kingdom of God on earth in the future when Jesus returns in his second coming. That kingdom of God is variously called the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, or the millennial kingdom or the millennium. Millennium, millennium means milliannum or a thousand years. We learn in Revelation chapter 20, it lasts exactly 1,000 years. So as I teach, sometimes you'll hear millennium, millennial kingdom, kingdom of God. It's all the same period of time. It's 1,000 years after the return of Christ at the end of the tribulation before eternity. And so verse 10, rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you who mourn for her, that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom, that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus says the Lord, behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. In the future a millennium, the Gentile nations of the earth recognize Jerusalem as its capital and Jesus as its king. Uh, and they, you know, like you see in the movies where foreigners bring oblations and sacrifices to the king, you know, they bring their bounty and all. Uh, I'm thinking of that famous scene in the Ten Commandments where they bring all kinds of good, cool stuff and then Moses comes walking in, you know, and talks for God. But uh, that's going to happen in the millennium where. Kingdom, or not kingdoms, but nations from all over the earth are going to visit the Lord and bring him stuff. And then it says, you shall feed on her sides, you shall be carried and dandled on her knees. That's a word for bounced. And so uh, that's, you know, obvi- that's your vocabulary word, I guess, for today is dandled. Uh, you'll use that a lot in your life. Uh, I guess you could use it of, other than bouncing kids on your knee. What else do we bounce? I don't know, balls. Dandle that ball. If you're a coach at basketball, that'd be great. Uh, Verse 14, when you see this, your heart shall rejoice and your bones shall flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants and his indignation to his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, the Lord will judge all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. And so this is second coming language. Uh, this is how the, the Lord prepares the world for the kingdom. And it says in verse 17, those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating a swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. And so the Lord is going to deal with unbelievers that exist at the beginning of the millennium. And, and we know from Matthew 24 and 25 that there's a judgment of the sheep and the goats, and those that are the goats are non-believers, and they're cast away for the time so that the kingdom can start. I'm fascinated here with the mouse, right? Um, uh, <laughs> mouse probably refers to, and this is so fun, myomancy. Myomancy is the practice of reading omens from the behavior of mice. I love it. And so this can be, you know, like if you went home right now and all of a sudden you heard and you looked up and through some trap door, thousands of mice and rats fell into your house, that's a sign. Uh, Now, it may just be a sign that you need an exterminator, but in the old days, it was a sign of something big, you know. Or they... uh, They had priests who would interpret the sounds that rodents make. That means uh, tithe. Uh, And (laughs) anyway, it's just, it's comical to me, but it's idolatry. And so those of you who are worshiping rodents don't. Uh, Verse 18, for I know their works and their thoughts. It shall be that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. So throughout the thousand years, Gentile nations will come to Jerusalem to bend the knee to Jesus and confess that he is Lord, whether they're believers or not. It says in verse 19, I will set a sign among them. We're unsure of the sign because we're not told, but uh, this is a passage that talks about God being mighty to save in that he's reaching out to those who have not heard of him yet. 
down through the generations as new children are born uh, to these uh, individuals. And maybe they end up somewhere where there's not a great knowledge of the Lord. He sees to it that they hear about him. Uh, it says, those I will set a sign among those who escape, uh, meaning Jews and Gentiles who endure to the end of the great tribulation. And so they're, as I said, they end up in human bodies needing to be evangelized. I will send to the nations, he mentioned some nations here, which are real nations, but the idea here is that God will go to the ends of the millennial earth to find people that need to hear the gospel. Uh, no matter what dispensation you look at, no matter what era or epoch or period of time, God is mighty to save. He is always saving. He is always reaching out in grace uh, and stimulating faith to bring people to him. There is no time that he, uh, you know, doesn't want to save. And they shall declare my glory to the Gentiles. People born in these faraway locations in the future kingdom will have a sin nature and they'll need to be evangelized. Then they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all nations on horses and in chariots and in litters, on mules, on camels to my holy mountain Jerusalem says the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And so save Gentiles, you're going to accompany Jews on their pilgrimages to and from the millennial temple. Verse 21, I will also take some of them for priests and Levites, says the Lord. He's talking about Gentiles. And so we know that God's intent for Jews is to be a kingdom of priests in the temple uh, in, in the millennium. And now he says, some of the Gentiles too, I'm going to allow to serve that way. And again, that's just to show himself merciful and wonderful. Uh, and then it says, as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord. We, we saw last time we were together that for the millennial kingdom, Jesus is going to be restoring the current earth that we live on and bringing streams to the desert and cleaning up this earth and just restoring it. After the millennial kingdom, he makes a new heaven and a new earth. This earth passes away, it burns up. Some have suggested from what Peter describes in his epistles that God just, you know, nukes the universe by, you know, letting go of the atoms that hold the universe together. But it'll be a completely new creation, we think, at that time. Uh, and, and so that's the deal there. So, uh, and it says, so shall your descendants and your name remain, and it shall come uh, to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to me and worship before me, says the Lord. Temple worship will be established, complete with sacrificial offerings and a full religious calendar. Will we bring offerings and keep the Sabbath and such? No. The church had no such practices in the book of Acts. Why would we do so in the kingdom? In, in fact, in the book of Acts, there was a council to say, you're not obligated to do anything Jewish. The church was and remains distinct from the nation of Israel and from Gentiles who are saved before and after the church age. As I mentioned earlier, we're not superior to Jews or to saved Gentiles that comprise the nations. We just are distinct in how God has dealt with us. And everyone gets saved the same way. You know, people jump to the conclusion and say, well, if you believe there's a difference between Jews and the church and Gentiles who are saved, you're teaching a different gospel. No, everyone is only always saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Any person in any dispensation at any time, there is no other way to get saved, no special way that the church got saved as opposed to Israel and vice versa. Verse 24, they shall go forth and look upon corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. Now, they are the all flesh or the mortal inhabitants of the millennium who come to visit Jesus in Jerusalem. On their journey, it would seem both ways, they see the corpses of tribulation transgressors. Uh, must see tourist site, right? And, and on your brochure, make sure you see the valley of the corpses uh, both ways. There are a few facts to consider before we can offer an interpretation. Midway into the seven-year great tribulation, the Antichrist goes into the tribulation temple. He says that he is God. He demands to be worshiped. The Lord said to the Jews in Judea who witnessed that abomination, uh, those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And so most scholars suggest that they do flee, and it's to Basra, to the rock city of Petra. They're pursued by the Satan-possessed Antichrist, Again, there seems to be no hope or help for them. 
But the Lord returns to the earth to Basra, where the armies of the Antichrist have the Jews surrounded. They call out to the Lord, as we saw, they are born again. Jesus destroys those enemies, and now he mounts a campaign from there back to Jerusalem, overcoming the armies of the world as he goes. In a previous study, we were made to understand that what we refer to as the Battle of Armageddon is really a longer campaign. It's not a single battle that lasts several hours or one day. It's a longer campaign beginning in Basra and ending up on the Mount of Olives. From Basra to Jerusalem, Jesus single-mouthedly defeats the armies of the world. Not single-handedly because it says the, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is like a sword in his mouth. And that's his weapon. He speaks and enemies are defeated. The campaign we call Gog and Magog, described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, that takes place sometimes during the tribulation and probably towards the end, adding to the death toll. It's difficult for us to grasp the extent of the carnage that will take place. The Bible compares it to a wine press that squeezes out the blood of the Lord's enemies. It says that blood poured out from that wine press reaches as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of about 200 miles. It's cute. People try and calculate how much blood a human body has and how many people that relates to. And, you know, I guess you could do that, but it's just a lot of people are going to die. A lot of people are going to die. In Ezekiel, we read, for seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, all the people of the land will be burying. They will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. The search party will pass through the land, and when anyone sees a man's bone, he shall set up a marker by it till the bar uh, barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and make fires of the weapons and burn them, and they will make fires of them for seven years. I call this the Corpse Corps uh, as opposed to the Peace Corps. And, you, know, you like that, Corpse Corps? I don't know. This valley is, I said earlier, also called the Valley of the Travelers or the Passengers or the Them Who Pass Through. And so there's a valley, you can find it on a map, and uh, it's got these various names, and it's along the road that the pilgrims will be taking back and forth to Jerusalem, and they will see this gravesite. And in verse 24, it says, their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Are there eternal flesh-eating worms? Why, well, this refers to maggots in an earthly setting. Remember, this is an earthly setting. These are corpses. And the idea that they don't die is a way of saying that they have an abundant food supply. They just keep existing and reproducing as maggots in order to keep eating these bodies. Uh, but not eternally. This is not a look into Hades or to the lake of fire. There's no mention of souls here, only corpses, cadavers. This is a mass grave site and it seems to be an open grave since travelers can see the corpses. Now, uh, this is kind of hard to swallow because we have a preconceived notion that the millennium is a perfect utopia. But we've seen one of the things that's really surprised me in digging into Isaiah is that there are a lot of things that are not perfect at all about the millennium or that you would not expect. But you should expect them because it is populated by unbelievers. And where there's unbelievers, there can't be perfection. And so once you get over this uh, fact that it's perfect, because a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, uh, this can't happen in the millennium. They can't be burying people and, and all in the millennium because that's perfect. So all this must take place way before that, but that's not true. And so you, you ruin your timeline by thinking that way. We've seen several times that there's some weird things about the millennial earth. And so these pilgrims are going to see these corpses. Now, you've undoubtedly seen pictures, or you know they exist, of piled up corpses of the Jews from the Holocaust. Even with that evidence and more, of course, there are people who say that the Holocaust never happened. Guess what? There are going to be people who say that Jesus' kingdom never happened. At the end of the thousand years, we read in Revelation 20, that the devil's going to be set loose from his prison in the abyss, 
and he's going to lead a final rebellion against the Lord and his people. And the human beings who join him are an innumerable company, millions upon millions upon millions who refuse to know the Lord, even though he exists in their midst as their king, and even though you and I and others are in glorified bodies, etc. And even though there is this proof, I mean, you want to, maybe you're witnessing to somebody in the millennium, you say, hey, come with me to the Valley of the Corpses when I've been there. Well, what do you think that is? That's uh, the FBI, uh, you know, or whoever making things up. That's a conspiracy theory. No, no, these people were killed at the coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the Great Tribulation. Yeah, I don't believe it. And so, the, sadly, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? And it's a sad thing, but finally, at the end of that time, uh, there will be only believers who will go on into the eternal kingdom uh, that will last forever and ever. How do you close this book? I found this quote, and it kind of ties it into our longings as well. It's as good as any other way. Uh, the anonymous author writes, and he says, the Christian watches with great interest in the providences of God towards the Jews, knowing that their return to their land is a preparation for the fulfillment of much prophecy and that Jesus Christ's coming is here. Come, Lord Jesus.